actually that brings him down gets caught. His head gets caught in the branches and when David's men see them, of course, he is done for. And that longing, longing, that cry from the heart, Absalom, Absalom, my son, my son, that I could have died in your place. And of course he could not, because only one can die in our place. And I want to speak about that one today as we look at John's Gospel, just briefly recapping where we are so far in chapter 6. First of all, we heard that the crowd was following Jesus because they saw the signs that he was doing with the sick. Then the festival of Passover is very near and Jesus looks at this huge crowd, over 5,000 there, and miraculously is able to feed them with the, the loaves and the fishes. And as a result, the people declare, this must be the prophet. And Jesus realizes that they're going to try and take him by force and make him king. He quickly withdraws. We may understand that he goes to be in prayer with his father when they talk about the, the mountain up in the mountain. That's, that's um, where he's seeking to be uh, quiet and with his Lord. Next morning, the crowd, still in hot pursuit, discover that he's on the other side of the lake. How did he get there? When did he get there? And Jesus recognizes their interest has far more to do with getting more food than recognizing the truth of who he is. What they want is a Messiah who's going to fill all their expectations and then some. And he says, do not work for food that perishes, but food that endures for eternal life, which the Son of Man will give you, says Jesus. And they respond, as you remember, what must we do to perform the works of God? You know, what must we do? How can we earn our way? What do we do? Our Lord turns and says very clearly, believe in him who God sent. Believe in him who God sent. Not a very satisfactory answer. Well, what sign are you going to do? What work are you performing? Our ancestors ate the manna in the wilderness, and it's written, see, see, they gave, he gave them bread from heaven to eat. They're talking about Moses. Jesus said it wasn't Moses that gave them bread, but it was my Father who gives you the true bread from heaven. For the bread of God is that which comes down from heaven and gives life to the world. And they respond, sir, Give us that bread always. Imagine never having to go shopping to the supermarket and again. And the phrase, if you remember, echoes a Samaritan woman when Jesus was talking about the water, the life-giving water. The water that I will give, he said to her, will become in them a spring of water gushing, gushing up to eternal life. And she says, sir, give me the water so I may never be thirsty or have to keep coming here to draw water. She seems a little more honest about why she wants this water. And I wonder sometimes if when Jesus retires up that mountain that he tears his hairs out and said, God, Father, when are they going to get it? Or words to that effect. But what he says to the crowd who gathers around them is, I am the bread of life. Whoever comes to me will never be hungry. Whoever believes in me will never be thirsty. Then from last week's reading to this, we skip a few verses, um, and, uh, but an important one, important uh, words in the, the passage that we miss is, this is the will of my Father, that all who see the Son and believe in him may have eternal life, and I will raise them up on the last day day. And then here we are, and guess what? The Jews are complaining about him, and that's not really a surprise. I am the bread of life. Whoever comes to me will never be hungry. Whoever believes in me will never be thirsty. And if you are familiar with the scripture that may echo in you that I am, remember when Moses said, who am I going to say sent me? I am. I am who I am. Tell them I am sent you. So already we're hearing echoes of the Exodus story. And then think of Moses, the God parting the waters and Moses walking through it. And here Jesus is walking on the water. 
The manna comes down from heaven, water springs from a rock. And guess what? The people are complaining. They're still complaining. Jesus is, John's listeners would recognize those echoes, those signs. And they're complaining. Because now, even though God now is standing in flesh with dirt between his toes in front of them, we know who this guy is, rather questionable parentage. Isn't this the son of Joseph? He doesn't look much like a conquering Messiah. Jesus said, no one can come to me unless drawn by the Father, and I will raise that person up on the last day. So this passage, and we've been looking at it in the various groups throughout the week, and a Tuesday group when the, the women meet on Tuesday mornings, and the Thursday group too, we've wrestled with some of, these, uh, some of this scripture. What does this mean? No one can come to me unless drawn by the Father. Are we getting into the murky waters of predestination? Does God have favorites? If God came to save the world, um, what happens to those who are not called? And unfortunately, our discussions didn't actually come up with a definitive answer, so I can't give you that today. But what we can say with certainty is that we cannot come of our own ability. We are drawn by God. We might think we had the idea first, but we are responding to the call that God placed in our hearts. Famously, C.S. Lewis wrote that God had closed in on him and he had badly wanted to escape. I was decided upon, he said. And then in his book, Surprised by Joy, he wrote, his compulsion is our liberation. God's compulsion, God's burning desire for us is our liberation. Jesus said, no one can come to me unless drawn by the Father, and I will raise that person up on the last day. So what are we talking about here in the raising up? In short, what we are talking about is the resurrection. Now these are difficult passages to wrestle with, and one writer whom I find particularly helpful when wrestling with some of this is the professor of New Testament and early Christianity at St. Andrews in Scotland, the retired Bishop of Durham, Tom Wright. He has written a book called Surprised by Hope. And if you find some of this troubling or interesting, you want to learn more or wrestle more, I highly recommend this book, Surprised by Hope. Wright says, Christ confronts the world in the present and will do so personally and visibly in the future. And quoting from Philippians, he is the one to whom every knee will bow. Now, there have been many books written about life after death, the rapture, experiences of angels in heaven. And some of them, I know, offer comfort to those who've lost loved ones, to those who are not sure what the future holds. Jesus says, this is the will of my Father, that all who see the Son and believe in him may have eternal life, and I will raise them up on the last day. So, let's be clear, Jesus will come from heaven in order to transform our present humble body into a glorious body like his own. Paul writes in Romans, if the Spirit of God dwells in you, then the one who raised the Messiah from the dead will give life to your mortal bodies as well, through his Spirit who dwells in you. When we turn to the Lord, when we accept Jesus as Lord, he lives in us. So what we are promised is not some amorphous spirit floating around the universe, neither reincarnation, no matter how much your cat reminds you of old Uncle Bert. <laughs> John writes in his first letter, we shall be like him, that is Jesus, we shall see him as he is. When we say the Eucharist prayer, what do we say? Christ has died, Christ is risen, Christ will come again. Do we say it because we believe it or just because it's there written? 
Christ will come again. We're talking about the resurrection. And no one can tell us about it because only Christ alone has been resurrected. Resurrection, says Wright, isn't life after death. It is life after life after death. So then that brings us to the question, so what happens in the meantime? What happens between death and resurrection when all together Christ will come? When we die, he said, we will join those who have gone before us in what some have called a restful happiness in the presence of Christ awaiting the final resurrection. Does that sound good? It's tough, I know. In the meantime, in between time, how we live on earth matters. Our bodies matter. This fragile earth we call home matters. Final quote from Wright, one of my favorites. What you do in the present by painting, preaching, singing, sewing, praying, teaching, building hospitals, digging wells, campaigning for justice, writing poems, caring for the needy, loving your neighbor as yourself, will last into God's future. They are part of what we may call building for God's kingdom. Now all this leaves us with some questions. What about those who don't believe, those who've rejected Christ, those who've never heard, those of other beliefs? Paul writes, if the Spirit of God dwells in you, then the one who raised the Messiah from the dead will give life in your mortal bodies as well, through his Spirit who dwells in you. So this in-between time, in-between death and resurrection, some have called it purgatory, although we think that has more to do with Dante than anything that we read in Scripture. St. Paul writes, I consider our present sufferings are not worth comparing with the glory that will be revealed in us. And we have only to look at the atrocities around the world. Thousands of Christians suffering, the desperation of refugees fleeing war, massacres of Auschwitz, of Hiroshima, of Darfur and Iraq, the grief of parents. The grief of a parent who loses a daughter because she didn't signal when she changed lanes. Scripture is clear, whether we like it or not, there will be judgment. And how we live on this earth now matters. My friends, I've done many funerals over the years, and I will hear people say, it happened so quickly, if only I had told them how much I love them. If only I had forgiven them, if only I had had that conversation, if only I had dared to share with them my face, if only, if only. My friends, now is the time to have those conversations, dear ones. Now is the time to reconcile. Now is the time to build bridges. Now is the time to offer and receive forgiveness. Now is the time to come on our knees and say, Lord, forgive me, I turn to you. Now is the time. None of us knows how long we have. But how we live today and tomorrow and the next day matters. We live in grace. We live with a promise when we say yes to our Lord. But it matters how we live today. This is hard teaching, I know. The things you need to do, do them now. Do it all Sunday afternoon. Write that letter, make that call. Say that prayer. Do it now. And if we're worried about what happens to people who don't know about Jesus, we might consider telling them. We don't have to bombard them. Share our hope. Share the hope, our reason for hope. 
Therefore, be imitators of God as beloved children, says St. Paul, and live in love as Christ loved us, gave himself for us, a fragrant offering and sacrifice to God. Fix your eyes on Christ, the source of salvation and hope. Face to face with a loving God, we did not shirk from suffering, who died that we might have life. God calls us. How will we respond? I am the bread of life, says Jesus. Whoever comes to me will never be hungry. Whoever believes in me will never thirst. Amen.